Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to another of our In Conversation events, Bradford Grammar School's series of interviews with old Bradfordians of note. Today, it's my great privilege and pleasure to be able to talk to A.D. Smith, one of the younger old Bradfordians whom we've welcomed back to school as part of this series. A.D. was a pupil at BGS from 1999 to 2009, and he's now an award-winning television presenter, journalist, and drinks personality. He co-presents The Three Drinkers on Amazon Prime, a show devoted to all things alcoholic, which has been streamed in 170 countries and in 39 languages. And the show has been described as the top gear of drinks programmes. AD has written the Wine and Spirits column for The Independent since 2017, and his journalism has also appeared in The Guardian and in the I newspaper. He's the global brand ambassador for Vivino, an online wine marketplace, which is the world's largest wine community. And he has a large Instagram following centered around drinks, lifestyle, well-being and travel. AD is one of only a small number of TV presenters with Tourette syndrome. And this is something we're going to talk about because it's very close to his heart. Indeed, when he was at BGS, uh, the previous headmaster, Stephen Davidson, asked AD to give an assembly to the whole school about the syndrome. And he continues to raise awareness of it in his professional life. AD also proudly flies the flag for the LGBTQ plus community. I think it's fair to say in all his media work, AD underlines his commitment to diversity, whilst at the same time displaying his characteristic witty approach and the slightly cheeky take on life for which he was well known during his time at BGS. If you've got questions for AD, please do type them into the Q&A box that you will find on Teams, and I will do my very best to put them to AD during the course of our conversation. So AD, you're most welcome. It's great to see you back at BGS again, albeit uh, through Teams. Welcome. And I'll kick off with the first question, if I may. Just tell us a little bit about what you remember of your time at BGS? What were your highlights and maybe what you didn't enjoy so much? Well, hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me. And it's amazing to be back. It's lovely to see the backdrop there on a, on your screen. And um, I mean, a lot of different memories, I suppose. First of all, to talk about some of the people who meant quite a lot to me when I was at BGS. And um, there was Mrs. Morris, who was in Clock House, wonderful teacher, who was the person who identified that I may have Tourette's syndrome, and that completely changed my life for the better. Um, there was Stephen Davidson, who I have such a love for. And, you know, ever since he ever since I, I began in school, he was the headmaster and just such a, a lovely chat with so much charisma and and personality. And he made my time in school so much more bearable when going through something that was, you know, quite scary when um, mm -hmm. when I just got my diagnosis. And I'll tell you more about that assembly at some point um, mm -hmm. in this conversation. But but yes, yeah, Stephen Davidson, fantastic chat. Neil Gabriel, who was the um, deputy head and then headmaster of Clock House, someone else who was an amazing role model throughout my time at school. And um, some of the things and the, the moments that I absolutely adored, you can probably tell just by me talking, theatre studies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. And I, I remember Miss Ball, Mr. Johnson and having Lottie, Hannah and Harriet and just having our little group of four people in sixth form and our, our wonderful theatre study sessions. And it was kind of like um, another world. We had such uh -huh. a beautiful little group. There was so much creativity flowing. And I think that was probably the best memory that I have being in the little group of, of theatre studies with people who I've come to absolutely adore and love and just being ourselves in our wonderful, wacky and weird ways. Right. Um, yeah. The lost, the lost property lady. Okay. I love, love the lost property lady. I was Val. Going, the, the name was Val, wasn't it? Val, good old Val, and her yeah. daughter Angie, who was at the That's top right. shop in the sixth form. Talked to Angie a lot. Um. And Angie's then, still here. Angie actually oh. cleans my office every day. And when the sixth form tuck shop is open, she's in there and the kids still love her. So she's still here. Val's retired now. 
please please say hello to Angie from me and Perfect. Angie can say hello to Val for me. And then, you know, um, Miss Fahi and Miss White, for anyone listening who remembers those two teachers, absolutely incredible human beings. And, you know, they, they just helped me find myself when I was in fourth year to sixth form. Um, really good people. Uh -huh. So, so yeah, lots of beautiful memories from the teaching staff to, you know, times that I'd had on school trips and whatnot. I know we did a school trip together to Malaga yeah. once, I believe. And that's right. We were just reminiscing before coming on live about the, your uh, exploits at night in Malaga, which <laughs> thankfully I didn't know about at the time, I'm really <laughs> pleased to say. Um, you've talked there about your love of theatre, but actually, I'm right, I'm right, you didn't go off and do drama or, or theatre when you left BGS. You went to do marketing and business, I think, at Lancaster. So tell us, you know, why did you choose that degree? And, and you know, has it been useful to you in your subsequent career? Yeah, I think a lot of people are quite shocked. Um, I got asked the question when I was leaving, what acting school are you going to? And I said, yeah. I'm not. And they were like, oh, OK. Um, no, I'd always wanted to study business or marketing to some degree or launch my own company. And that fed in me, want, like fed into me um, studying business studies when I was at school. In, in terms of university, so I went to Lancaster University and I'd say that a degree is important for many different reasons. Um, I'd say in my experience, it was much more for the life experience, you know, that community, growing friendship groups, the relationships that you build with different people. Yeah. I definitely think that I took some business acumen away from the course itself. But I think it's just growing up a little bit. And, you know, we, we have different, I'd say that we have different identities as we grow up through life. We have our identity when we're at school, we have our identity when we're at university, and then we have our identity when we start our first work life, and then it continues. But it was a, a lovely to be able to, you know, have a, have a new form of identity and meet new wonderful people along that life journey. So life experience more than anything and discovering who you are as a person is what I took away from university. How do you how do you think then you you know you left your BGS self behind a bit is that what you're saying how did you kind of reinvent yourself when you when you went to university so I mean my, my quirkiness definitely went with me I've always been quite uh -huh. quirky and irreverent but I don't think that will ever change <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think I think one one thing I I come to terms more with my sexuality in terms of being gay yeah. and being a lot more open with that whilst I was at university um, yeah. and, and just generally feeling more comfortable in one's, one own skin, one's own skin. You know, yeah. when we're at school, we're still kind of finding out who we are. We're still growing. Yeah. We're still developing our mindset and, and what we love and what we believe in. And when we get to university, that solidifies that little bit more. Sure, sure. And I think when you were at university, you spent some time in the USA. Is that right? It's part of your degree and obviously you've been to the USA on a school trip in the sixth form. Was that with economics or politics or business? Tell us a little bit about your love for the USA. Yeah, so that was that's a good story. I am, um, as I say, I studied business studies, but I didn't study politics. Yeah. And there was a trip over with the politics department to the US and I begged and begged them to let me go on this trip because I've been desperate for years to go over, but never had. It turns out there was one place left. So I was lucky enough to go on it. And we went to New York, we went to DC, Philadelphia. And wow. I just, I totally fell in love with the country. I still have the boarding pass from that BA flight and a leaf from Central Park on a cork board in my bedroom at home in Bradford. Still there, wow. the leaf is still wow. intact. I'm sure you were. I'm sure you enlivened that trip as much as you enlivened the trip to Malaga <laughs> that you went on with me. So you know the USA is clearly a, a place that you that you love. Uh, how has it left its mark on you? I mean, you know, when I went over there on that school trip, I thought to myself, one day I will I will live here, and that's exactly what I did when I went to university. I got a placement year there, and after that, I went back over and lived there for for several more years. And I suppose it, it kind of opens your eyes to another culture. I would definitely implore anyone who is about to go into university and, and has, and even those who are looking for, you know, just expanding their, their life to some degree to go and live in another country at some point, at some stage in their life. It's never too late to follow a new passion. But for those who are thinking about taking a university degree or whatnot, or those who are currently in a job where they have the ability to go abroad and work abroad, absolutely do it. It opens your mind to so many new cultural ways of thinking. And it's just a beautiful experience to have.
Sure, sure. So your placement year was working, was it? And I think when you um, graduated as well, you ran a media company, is that right? Yeah, so I ended up going over to San Francisco and working for an advertising agency. And it was during that time where I kind of fell in love with wine and spirits. And yeah. the story to this really is it took me about 60 hours from the UK over to San Francisco because the plane was delayed. There were all types of things that were going wrong. So this 60 hour trip that had taken place. And when I got there, the first thing I had to do was go to a networking event for my university because they hadn't done one in years, in about five years. So they said, okay. you know, you better go and meet some people. So that's exactly what I did. Went off to this hotel and it suddenly dawned on me that I was 20 and that I couldn't drink because it was 21 over uh -huh. in the States. And I had another four months of yeah. this purgatory where <laughs> I wasn't allowed to drink. So I walked through this, this door to this networking event. And this chap comes over and he looks right at me and he goes, hi, I'm Steve, shakes my hand. You need a glass of wine and just grabs one from the side and puts it into me. And I think, I like this guy. Turns out that Steve Smith, he went to the same university as I did, studied the same course, was in the same halls of residence, albeit 20 years prior. But he also grew up down the road in Bradford from me as well. Okay. And we instantly hit it off. And he and his wife owned an urban garage east winery in the heart of Silicon Valley as a hobby and they did this with several other couples and so that was how I fell in love with wine I started volunteering at their winery and it just from there you know no longer was I necking back bottles of yellowtail at university before I went out to uh, the sugar house it was it was about drinking things that I genuinely enjoyed the taste of and finding this new wow. love and appreciation so no fake ID required there then, that's, that, that's excellent. Yeah, so uh, what other steps did you take then to kind of, in, you know, improve your knowledge about alcoholic drinks? Did you study, did you read, did you take a course? So I've, I've always been a believer that you can take courses and you know you can you can read all the books and take the mm -hmm. test but for me it all boils down to experience and I've probably tasted professionally now anywhere between 10 different drinks everything from wines and spirits. I mean, there's 10,000 different grape varieties along the planet. And, yeah. you know, several thousand of those, I think 3,000 of those are, are being made into or produced into wine currently. And so a mixture of just really being into these different drinks, going out, writing about them, experiencing, exploring everything, as I say, from white wines and sparkling wine to mixology and beer and everything in between. And it was just the love of tasting the different nuances that made me fall in love with it. And I describe this like, think of a painting, think of a painting, you've got your canvas, and then you've yeah. got your palette and your palette, you've got all your different types of paint or you've got your pencils or your chalk or whatever it is. And you use all these different pieces to create this beautiful painting or this beautiful picture in front of you. For mm -hmm. me, that's exactly what wine and spirits are and mixology. Yeah. It's this piece of art. It's not just something that you have to get drunk. It's so much more than that. Sure. Good. Yeah. So journalism, media work. Tell us how you kind of began that. What came first? Was it writing? Was it TV? How did you break into the whole media thing? I was hosting an event in London and it was to do with the company that I've been the global brand ambassador for for about six years called Vivino. It's an app on the phone where you take a picture of a bottle of wine. You've probably yeah. seen people walking around the supermarket, staring at wines, taking pictures of them. Um, I was at an event and the editor of The Independent was there. And we'd had a couple of glasses of this, you know, wonderful wine that I picked out in the event. And he walked over and he went, Aidy, it's such a shame it would be a conflict of interest for you to write for us. And I went, no, I wouldn't. And he went, <laughs> don't you want to write for us then? And I thought, right. yeah, why not? <laughs> so right. that's where my career at The Independent began, from having right. some fascinating conversations about wine with one of the editors. And from there, it just fell into place. Right, yeah. And what do you think then makes a good wine and spirits column what you know what are the best um ingredients if you like of writing a, an entertaining a successful wine column i would say to that my premise has always been a lot of wine experts or you know spirits experts always say follow me i'm an expert follow me listen mm -hmm. to what i'm saying here my premise has always been let's go on this journey together and uh, sometimes i don't even refer to myself as an expert i prefer to just say i'm a wine and spirits lover 
and yeah. you know i've done i've done a bit of research i i know what i like let's find what you like as well let's go on this journey at the same time and i yeah. think to that point i'm often asked ad what makes a good wine or a good spirit you know what is good and the answer to that question is whatever you like whatever you mm -hmm. like in your glass is good to you and don't let anyone tell you differently because there's so many people out there with their own pretentious views swirling glasses and talking tasting notes about the black current and you know whatever it might be but you know don't don't listen to that follow your palate because we're also subjective and drink what you enjoy drinking simple as yeah. that yeah you've kind of already uh, touched on my next question really which is for oh. me you know who's who's not a great <laughs> drinker actually there's a lot of mystique about wine and spirits you know you read these columns and, uh, and it's all for very pretentious and you know all that language that goes goes with it what do you think is the best way to break down these barriers and get people genuinely interested in in wine and spirits make it more accessible Sure, lifestyle. I think by taking lifestyle and taking the different senses that we have and merging those all together, and you'll see that all the content that we produce through, through the TV show, you won't see us standing there, as I said, swirling glasses no. and talking about how it has nuances of caramel and charred oak and freshly cut tennis ball and yeah. all of that. Jazz. <laughs> because, you know, there's just there's no room for that. What makes you fall in love with something? It's it's the culture, it's the history, it's it's all the sensations surrounding it. So I'd say absolutely the lifestyle elements. And, yeah. you know, I, I've always written about things in a very different kind of way. I remember being in fourth year with, with a teacher called Mr. Reese, and there was an essay that was set. And I think we had to write a paper about a letter, just like A, B, C, D or, or whatnot. I totally misunderstood what the whole project was about and ended up writing this very, you know, emotional turmoil essay about Hurricane Katrina and this <laughs> devastating you know, thing that uh, completely off brief, 100% off brief. But when, when Mr. Reese got it, he was like, God, this, you know, this is quite striking. It's not the brief at all, but went off and had a conversation with, um, with the department. And anyway, I ended up being allowed to submit it and got really high marks for it. <laughs> so <Fantastic. laughs> I think the, the writing style, I've, I've always tried to push the norm and do something yeah. somewhat different to what everyone else is doing. Right. So you find a lot of cheek, a lot of irreverence and a lot of kind of, you know, rhetorical yeah. questions in, in why good. I run. Yeah, good. We've had a, a question here from an anonymous uh, viewer. Uh, how has this lockdown year affected your work due to the impact on the hospitality industry? So the interesting thing about what I do is I support a lot of hospitality, but I'm not necessarily in hospitality itself. I'd say that from a TV show perspective, we've had to put obviously a hold on the country that we were going to film in next yeah. just because we've been able to get out there. But, you know, on that same level, we've completely pivoted all of our energy into online. So our website has taken off completely. We've been doing a lot of online tastings. We've got an award-winning podcast that we brought out and we've got several other things that we've launched since lockdown began to kind of, you know, add a bit more creativity and, and evolve, I, I suppose. And yeah. a lot of cocktail bars in the same way that they've had to close down have launched drink at home cocktails. Yeah. So what I would say is, um, if you want to think about how you can support hospitality, a lot of them are doing weekend, Friday, Saturday meals, or as I say, drink at home cocktail kits. Have a little look, see what's local and, and order to your home, whether in London or Yorkshire. I think it's yeah. happening countrywide. Sure, sure. Yeah. So was it your writing? This You said you started at The Independent. Did that kind of lead you into TV work gradually? Um. In, in some ways, I mean, I had a TV, well, I, I didn't have a TV show. I was on a TV show. I was a child actor when I was a lot younger. So when I was in Clock House in first year, I was on a TV series called The Big Bag, which was on CITV. But oh, that was a very, very, very long time ago. And I'd always wanted to try and reconnect the dots, but it hadn't really hit me until I met a friend called Helena Nicklin. So Helena is like my, she's my work wife. She's my soulmate, my co-presenter, my co-director. Everything we do, we, we do together. We're like the yeah. Phil and Holly of drinks is how we've been described <laughs> and i'm okay with that yeah he's quite good. handsome <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so we you know met helena and um, and it always dawned on me uh, when i was younger my Tourette's hadn't been as pronounced and um, it was you know it was in its it was dormant to be quite yeah. honest and it only came out as i'd already got the part but if you think about it, if you go into a screening process of someone who has Tourette syndrome and someone doesn't understand what that is the first thing they think is oh we can't have him he's going to swear he'll swear on screen and only six percent of people with Tourette syndrome actually swear it's called coprolalia 
And, you know, it's a symptom of Tourette's syndrome. So if I ever went into a screening situation, it would be against me. So we thought, you know what, let's make our own TV show. Yeah. And so that's exactly what we did. So we right. own our own TV show, our own format, our own IP. Everything is ours. It's our baby because we thought no one else is going to do it. So let's make it happen ourselves. Um, but that that all took place when Helena and a friend of ours called Colin, we were um, sitting in a place called Milroy's in Soho in London. It's a whiskey mm -hmm. bar, funnily enough. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, we were just sitting there thinking, God, there's nothing on TV about alcohol that puts education, you know, second. As I say, swirling glasses mentality. We don't just want to watch a bunch of people go along and swish glasses and talk about something that we at home can't taste. It needs to be described in a different kind of way, in a much more entertainment driven kind of way. And we were sitting there and we thought, right, no one else is doing anything like this. Let's do it ourselves. And as I say, we went off. We had 30 years of experience in the journalism drinks world between all of us. We'd worked with many of these different brands before. We went to them and said, we've got an idea. Do you want to be a part of it and fund it? And thankfully they said yes. And the rest was history. I think you're muted. I think you might be muted. <laughs> I am. There you go. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. I'll just say I've watched a couple of episodes and I've really enjoyed it, actually. I've, it's uh, it's very different to Julie Goulden, the, the food and drink show from a, a long time ago. You're, you're, you're far more entertaining. Um, the oh, three of you seem you. to enjoy yourself very much you prance around scotland drink lots of whiskey uh you perform some scottish country dancing which is a uh very funny, I have to say. You're not very good, Aidy. You uh, travel to these stunningly beautiful uh, islands. You think you're on Isla, the one that I watched, and you cut peat with a kind of caricature of a, of, a, of a Scotsman. I mean, the three of you, you seem to get on very well together, but you're quite different characters. Obviously, you knew um, Helena first. How did you kind of all meet up in the first place? How did you get to know each other? Just through journalism, because right. we have kind of the same circles. I mean, the wine and spirits world is a very, very tiny place. Even though it seems quite big, it is fairly small. And we'd see each other at different spirits or wine tasting events that we went to. I'd actually met Helena several years prior to that at a big tasting. Yeah each other really well and we let's definitely do something after this you know let's meet up never spoke to each other again for two years because <laughs> right. it's just that's the way it goes you meet all these different people yeah. but um but yeah i've met colin on a trip and had some downtime with him got to know him really well he actually lives just down the road from where i am now and and similar with helena we just had an instant chemistry and connection mm -hmm. and when you have that with someone when helena and i had that we just knew that something's gonna we're gonna work here something's gonna happen here and and it did Great, great. You're obviously a presenter, but you're also a producer, aren't you? So, you know, tell us about the two different roles. Which role do you enjoy more? <laughs> oh, the presenting side. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> the presenting side. Um, I, you know, the, the producing side is a lot of strenuous hours behind the scenes on a computer, lots of phone conversations, um, a hell of a lot of admin. It, yeah. It's basically all the making the TV show come together yeah. and work. And yeah. if I could choose one side, you know, I, I prefer just to be a pretty face on camera. Wow. <laughs> so there are some Maybe. down there are some downsides to being on TV then, are there? In in this situation, yeah. I mean, you look behind me and you probably think, oh wow, look at all that alcohol that's yeah. there and get that on a daily basis oh i'd love to just go around scotland and drink and then you realize that that was for about a month of the year and then everything else is is painstaking blood sweat and tears of getting a tv right. shot around so right. it's not as glamorous as it sounds but it, right. i still wouldn't change it for the world sure sure and you're working with amazon prime obviously a major force now in streaming services uh, do you enjoy working with them yeah they've been fantastic they've been absolutely fantastic i think that you know the the um the future is out there and we'll see what else comes over time but for now with this current series they've been good partners very good excellent I mean, would you like to develop your media career perhaps in a more longer established broadcaster at some point watch this space <laughs> right very good so Obviously, I've read that the Three Drinkers is like the top gear of, of drinks uh, programmes. Um, are you Jeremy Clarkson? Are you Richard Hammond? Or perhaps you're the Stig? Oh, I, do you know what? I'll go with whichever one sounds more complimentary. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe the stick, I don't know. Okay, very good. I've got a question here uh, from uh, Sarah Horsfield, Mrs. Horsfield, who teaches art, who's head of art at uh, BGS. You remember her maybe as Miss Cowan when she, um, well, before she got married. Um, and she says, your, enth your enthusiasm for life is infectious, which I think is certainly true. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of my favourite subjects is enjoying the gra enjoying the grape. So I think she enjoys a, a tipple now and again as well. Her question for you is, what's your next big dream? Your next big dream job? Oh, my next big dream job. I, do you know what? I have delved into the world of mental health and anxiety and, and diversity in terms of disabilities and whatnot. And one thing that I do want to do is have much more of an involvement within that. I think that I was very lucky in terms of having the support that I did behind me because of what Bradford Grammar School is and because there was enough support there for people to know about my disability. And yeah. there was still, you know, there was still um, hurtful moments surrounding that which you can't get away from as someone who has a disability like this um, but I think I'm a damn sight luckier than a lot of other people out there and what I want to do is make the world a much more open place specifically for those who have Tourette's syndrome because it is so massively massively understood uh, one in every 100 kids has some form of tic disorder or Tourette's and it's the same number of, of kids who have autism but despite that, there is such little help out there and, and so few specialist centres. Um, so I think that's one big dream is to get much more involved with that. And I do remember with Mrs. Horsfield slash Miss Cowan making a like a headdress, which was a dragon with massive feathers on it. And that's uh -huh. still at home in the top of a cupboard. <laughs> I specifically remember making that with Miss Cowan. It's, right. it's still there. I, unless my mom's thrown it out, which is possible because there's a lot of <laughs> shite in that bedroom from when I was there. Very good. Yeah. Are you planning a second series of the Three Drinkers? Um, obviously, it might be difficult to film during lockdown, but will the series carry on? I, I will get in trouble if I talk too much about that. Ah, um, I mean, obviously, secret. well, obviously, I don't think we're going to leave it at just one, but that, yeah, there will be other things in the future. Uh, uh, as to what they are, I can't quite say just yet. OK, very good. Obviously, you've got an internet channel as well, which features your, your work. And we'll, we'll perhaps move on and talk about that in a minute. It's got video clips, podcasts, articles, reviews, both about you know drink spirits, but also about things like mental health. How important is the internet for you in your career? Massively, massively important. Mm. I think that... You know, the internet has positives and downfalls. One of the positives that comes with this specifically is that we have now more access to information to help guide us on our journey than we've ever had before. Um, you know, don't go to um, Mayo Clinic and, and look up symptoms because you'll probably think you're always dying. I've made that mistake before. Don't do it. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you want to find things that can help you with your mental health or find, you know, advice about what to drink in a really non pretentious way, then the three drinkers dot com is, is our website. And we basically created a hub for everything that is wine, spirits, lifestyle. And now we're delving into more of that mental health side based on the experiences that both Helena and I have had. Um, and, you know, everything from top lists and guides on the best sipping tequilas to the best um, gins for martinis mm -hmm. to more kind of topical stuff like the first wine theme park in South Korea that's coming out. And, you know, all these uh, Mrs. Horsfield would probably like that one. The wine theme park. There you go. Um, as you know, it's holiday sorted. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so everything from that to, to the more mental health awareness. And that has been something that I think more now than ever is incredibly important. Um, you know, I, I suffer from chronic fatigue and anxiety. Um, as a result of burning out, working too hard, and also as a side effect of having Tourette's syndrome and, and the kind of excess energy and, and feeling exhausted from that. And over the years, I've learned so many different techniques um, to to help fend off anxiety, everything from light and different looks and getting in front of, you know, I've got my, you can see this half of my face is a lot brighter because I actually have a Lux light over in the corner yeah. of the room right now, yeah. shining on me. And it's everything from light to green, you know, trees and the positivity and elements yeah. that has on us, um, writing, sense, sounds, um, a moving CBD, connecting the relationship we have with people, our gut, our breathing, mm -hmm. yeah. our mood, and all these different 
I suppose, coping mechanisms that we can incorporate within our lives to make us happier. So I'd say if you are finding yourself a bit down right now, if you're struggling, you're feeling anxiety, you're feeling stress, go to the threedrinkers.com and look at the top for life hacks for 2021 in terms yeah. of mental yeah. health. Click yeah. on that, watch some of those videos because yeah. it should help set you in a, in a better kind of yeah. step. Yeah, it's a it's a big topic, I think, in, in schools as well now in education. And you've got these uh, video clips, haven't you? you Call them Mind, Sense and Soul, I think. I watched a couple of those. You present some, Helena presents some, and they seem to me to be, uh, you know, really excellent advice for, for people. I mean, are they popular? Do you know how many people watch them? Have you got any idea? I think we, we just handed in the stats for that. And in total, there are about 900,000 interactions across the board with that campaign. Uh -huh. So yeah. it went out across um, email, it went out across website, it went out across multiple different social mediums. And we've had so much um, comment or feedback, should I say, back from that campaign. That was the first campaign we did, which wasn't directly involved with drinks. We ventured yeah. out and we took a bit of a leap of faith based on the fact that we've both suffered with forms of anxiety before. And sure. yeah, five, six minute videos with about four different p bits of advice within each about how you can combat your anxiety. Great, yeah. You're also quite big on Instagram, I think, aren't you? At Sipped, I think that's your Instagram account. Um, again, social media is clearly very important for your work, would you say? Massively, again, it's it's super, super important. I think the, the thing that we always have to be mindful of there, though, and one thing I always try to do is show what real life is as well. Yeah. You know, yes, you'll see me going around tasting 52-year-old Dalmore whiskies and, and all this beautiful stuff while filming. But at the same time, there is another side to life. And I think that a lot of anxiety is fed off of looking at other people and thinking, oh my God, their life is perfect. Why am I not feeling like that? Mm -hmm. Which isn't always the case. So I'm quite open about when I'm having bad days or when I'm suffering about things sure. and telling people, you know, it's okay to feel like this. Yeah. We're not always going to be our, our very yeah. best. And we need yeah. to give ourselves time to relax and, and just get back to a good state of mind so we can conquer the world again. Sure. I think people might describe you as a, a lifestyle TV presenter. I don't know if you like that label or not. Are you happy in that genre or would you perhaps like your, to see your TV career go in another direction in the future? Um, I think for now I'm I'm happy with that. I, what I don't want to be known as is just a drinks person. Yeah, uh, I want to. I want to kind of move more out, and as I say, I want to venture more into the mental health world as well, and and help as much as I can as yeah. I continue to develop my career. I've got a really good relationship with the Tourette Association of America because a lot sure. of my work is based in the US, as yeah. well as Tourette Action, which is the charity over in the UK as well, and um, will continue to work where I can with them. Um, in order to build more awareness, yeah. Sure, sure. Just before we move on to Tourette's, really, I've got another question here from uh, one of our viewers uh, about drinks, actually. There appears to be a growing market for non or low alcohol beer and wine. What are your thoughts on this? And do you have any recommendations? I absolutely do. In fact, I, I didn't have time just before this started to pour myself one, but I was going to pour ah. myself. This is called Acorn. Uh -huh. So it's called Acorn Aromatic. They have three different um, skews within their line. This is by far my favorite. And it's so this is a non-alcoholic spirit. And you just mix this with a bit of tonic water. So 50 milliliters of this, you know, uh -huh. half a little thing of tonic water and some ice. And th there is some really good non-alcoholic spirits out there, but there's also a load of utter yeah. as well. And okay. so you really you really have to be careful in terms of what you get. Um, now, I'd say that Everleaf, um, Acorn, which is these guys, and Mockingbird Spirit are three of my favourites. I'll say that one more time in case anyone wants to write them down. But Acorn, which is this yeah. one here, Everleaf, and also Mockingbird Spirit, um, three of my favourites. In terms of the wine side, non-alcoholic wines are still being discovered and the only one right now on the market which i really like is called mcguigan mcguigan zero and they've got a fantastic rosé um there's a couple of other imitation wine products that i can't remember off the top of my head right now but if you go to the three drinkers.com we have written so much about non-alcoholic spirits wow. it's a huge thing hard seltzers as well and um, uh, you know 
about six months ago, I was totally naysaying hard seltzers, thinking, why the hell would I just want to drink flavoured fizzy water? But then after having tried a couple, I've really gotten into them. And there's one brand called Oto, O-T-O, which does non-alcoholic sparkling seltzers that have CBD in them as well. I think there's about 25 right. milligrams of CBD per can. Right. And they have a bunch of health benefits. Um, I could go on and on and on about yeah. this. And on, on the beer side, um, there is one called Lucky Saint and also huh? Small Beer. They are by far the two right. best beers on the market, Lucky Saint and Small Beer. Um, yeah, I won't Great. buy Jack in terms of drink talk, <laughs> but yeah. Great recommendations there. I'm sure Mrs. Horsfield's writing all of those down. So <laughs> well done. Let's let's get a bit more serious perhaps and talk a little bit more now about Tourette's syndrome. Obviously, you describe yourself on your website as one of the few TV presenters in the world with Tourette. Tell us, you know, tell us when you were diagnosed, perhaps, how you coped with it at school. Tell us about this assembly which Stephen Davidson asked you asked you to give. You know, tell us all about it if you don't mind. Yes, I mean, my symptoms started when I was about seven years old. And at this point, one, no one knew what the hell it was. And two, even medical professionals didn't know what the hell it was because it's just such an unexplored territory. And so at home, we were kind of, you know, what on earth is this? What's going on? And I obviously started to feel a tremendous amount of guilt because when something like this happens, you assume that you're just being bad. You're being badly behaved. You don't understand it, but you're doing it and it's something you shouldn't do. And that becomes, you know, quite upsetting. It was Mrs. Morris, who was a teacher. I think she's since retired. I hope yeah, she's has, since yeah. retired. She did. Yeah. She did. Morris. She did. Has a break. Yeah. Yeah. She has um, retired, yeah. <laughs> Not long <laughs> so ago, actually, only a few years oh. ago, but she has retired now. I hope she's somewhere nice and sunny at the moment. I hope she escaped the country and is uh, living in Barbados or something. I, I think she lives in Scotland, actually, in, in Dumfries okay. and Galloway. So <laughs> maybe not so, so sunny. Sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice warm fireplace. There you go. Yeah. It, was, it was Mrs. Morris, yeah, who um, who watched a documentary and she got in touch with my mom. And she went, you know, I've, I've obviously been observing Adrian because he's in my class. And I think that it might be possible that he has this. And so my mom went and did a bit of research, spoke to a comedian who was down in London who had Tourette syndrome and he's since retired as well. But he said, you know, if you ever need any help, then get in touch. I would recommend doing X, Y and Z. Yeah. And one of the recommendations was to contact Great Ormond Street, which is down obviously down here in London because they had one of the only specialist centres for Tourette's. So we travelled down to London and we got the diagnosis. But, you know, as I alluded to earlier, there's, there's what, 300,000 kids right now in the UK have Tourette's syndrome and there's three specialist centres across the whole of the UK. That's 100,000 kids to each specialist centre. Now, I was lucky in that, you know, my mum had been very proactive about it. So I was able to get a diagnosis extremely quickly, figure out what was wrong with me and then start the journey of, of trying to manage whatever it was. Yeah. But not, ever, not everyone else is as lucky. And in terms of school, you know, I, I mentioned it when I went into sixth form. Sorry, I mentioned it when I went into senior school. Prior to that, it's something that I, I kind of kept to myself. And, you know, kids will be kids. There was a lot of bullying that took place around it because they didn't understand it. And I think for the vast majority of those kids that, you know, kids will be kids for a couple. And even after I made that announcement, very few people, there was some very malicious, you know, comments made and people who well into the future continue to say things and actually confronted one of those people in my last year. And I'm glad that I did. Mm -hmm. um, I just think mm -hmm. some people, sadly, uh, uh, they either have stuff going on at home themselves um, yeah. that make yeah. them the way they are, or they just don't grow up out of that, that way of, of sure. being, which is sad, but I hope for the best for them. I hope the best for them. Um, and but the, the assembly, yeah. So it was my first year in senior school. And as I said, I'd spoken to Stephen Davidson quite a lot prior to that. And he'd been a great support mechanism in, in that journey of, of being accepting about it. And, and he said, right, we can do something here. It's up to you. But I'm more than happy to host an assembly and tell everyone what it is. You can either be in the room or you can leave the room if you don't want anyone looking at you. But I will tell everyone in that room who you are, what you have, and to not, you know, make fun of it or just to understand what it is and so I opted to leave the room because I didn't want everyone staring at me on my first day in senior school I think that would have petrified the living hell out of me um but that assembly could have done one of two things it could have made things substantially worse or it could have made things substantially better uh -huh. and it made things substantially better sure. so you know great yeah. all round and right. I looking back I think it took a hell of a lot of courage to have made that decision 
And I know that a lot of other kids will be in similar situations, but I would implore them to do it because sure. the more people who are aware, the less they can hold it against you in that way. It's more of an accepted thing. And then I think there's still a lot of stigma, isn't there, in society about it? And is it awareness? Do you think awareness of, of it and understanding it better is the only real way to overcome the stigma? Absolutely. I mean, if you look, and everyone who is listening right now, if you think about the last time that Tourette's syndrome came up on a social media feed or a website, it was more than likely about someone shouting out curse words or doing something that involved coprolalia that was taboo and yeah. not the day to day. And there's so many different little day to day things that people with Tourette's syndrome face that you would never even think about, like trying to sleep. If, if someone's worked up and, you know, you have motor tics and vocal tics and right now, I'm very much focused on this interview, on this talk, on this situation, on this occasion. Therefore, all my energy is going into this. My tics, much like when I'm on camera, are non-existent because sure. the energy and the focus is being directed into something that I'm having fun doing. If I was bored shitless right now, then my Tourette's would be going off massively, but very I'm good. not. Um, sure. So so, um, so I'd say that, yeah, that sleeping can be very, very difficult. Um, given that you know if you've got motor tics in bed think about when you when you're going through a tough day how hard it is to just sleep anyway now yeah. imagine that your arm or your leg keeps moving or shifting and sure. it wakes you up again and and you know when we have an injury the first thing that we do if i hurt my arm the first thing i'll do is develop a tick in my arm so that injury or that sprain now can't heal as quickly as it possibly would um you know there's all these different things beyond just swearing about Tourette's syndrome that people don't think of sure Sure. Um, I've just had a comment here from somebody who I think you may well know called Sanjin, who says, correction, I can confirm that Aidy's love for fine wine started on an all-inclusive boat trip in Croatia. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's obviously a bit of a private joke, but it's clearly it made you laugh anyway. So that, that's great. Thank oh, you, to Sanjin. You're, so you're, so also, so you're also a strong advocate for, for LGBT rights. And there aren't many TV presenters like yourself who are openly gay. Was your sexuality an issue when you were at BGS? Uh, did you suppress it? Did you uh, tell anybody about it? I think I think I had various stages with it. I think that to a degree, I mean, I was at times I was quite camp at school, and I think it was quite obvious um, yeah. that you know I, I may have been gay. But at the same time, I had a lot of denial as well, and yeah. I didn't quite know what was going on. Um, I think sometimes I may have played on it a little bit because I wasn't again aware of what was happening um, but it, it was to a degree difficult being to my knowledge one of the very few people who was gay within the school and yeah. I know that as, as generations go on so you know the next generation down from us there's a hell of a lot more education and awareness about it to the point where it's you know, so kids who are five and seven and they came yeah. one day and they were just talking about one of their classmates who was with, you know, they said, oh, Adam's with John now or something. You know, as, as kids do, they have these little um, pairing up uh, cute things yeah. when they're kids. Yeah. And, and she went, oh, I didn't know Adam was gay. And her, her, her seven-year-old was like, no, like, why do you have to put a stigma on it? He's just him. And it was like, <laughs> wow. And she said, yeah. it's, just, it's eye-opening how, you know, what once was used as just a passive insult, as someone yeah. say, oh, stop being gay then yeah. has, has gone on to just being you know an everyday thing and thank goodness for that and i think that yeah. clearly there's a lot more work to be done sure. and there's a lot more education across the board especially in certain countries and um, I, I wouldn't say that i was ever harassed because of being gay at bgs at all or i wouldn't say i was ever bullied for it sure. i think there was misunderstanding about it and i yeah. think that you know when when i was a bit more open about it. i think i did lose a couple of friends because uh -huh. they were a bit you know they didn't want to be associated with that in case it made them look bad it wasn't a cool thing you know mm -hmm. to, to be or to do but i'd like to hope that the general awareness and the way that the world is going has changed that perception and yeah. i think from what i've seen um it has and and i will i'll just add on to this as well seeing as sanyan sent in that question sanyan is is one of my oldest dearest friends from bradford grammar who um who i've spent many a time many a fun occasion with and he was also he frequented the trips to a lost property as well where we had the ah. wonderful talks with val <laughs> yeah so he'll, he'll definitely remember those conversations too we had a great deal of time talking with val um i'm going to 
I've got a, a comment here actually from Debbie Chalashika, who is a biology teacher uh, here, uh, who obviously taught you, who just says, what an inspirational talk. It's wonderful to see where the path of life has taken you. And also she says hello to Sanyin as well. And thank you. So that, that's great. AD, you're clearly a bit of a campaigner. Where do you think your campaigning spirit comes from? Um, I mean, to be honest, it probably all stems back to just me having Tourette's. And I've always yeah. wanted to, I'm the type of person who always tries to fix broken things as well. It's probably why my uh, love life is so doomed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I just, based on the people who helped me when I was growing up and the people yeah. who've come into my life over several stages, who've had a tremendous impact on me. And one person I didn't mention was JP, a guy called John Paul Leddy, who he basically properly publicly helped me come out um, when I was in San Francisco when I was 21 so before that time I hadn't actively officially you know stated 100% I am gay until yeah. I met him and he was a dear friend who has sadly since passed away god rest his soul um, but you know he gave me the courage to mm -hmm. just be who I am it's people like him who raised millions of pounds for charities without you know ever expecting anything in return uh, and people throughout my life who've given me a one-up like steve smith in san francisco um like my mom who struggled with her own health issues you know she had a job that she loved she had a brain abscess she ended up losing half of the vision in each of her eyes she struggled throughout life but she's not stopped or slowed down she's kept going and you know all, all of my family my sister's a great inspiration as well uh, and i think the people who i've had in my life have really helped me think you know what's what's great about life helping other people and so i fully intend on where i can continue right now to help people in the Tourette community and all those parents i on a weekly basis i get so many instagram messages from people saying i know you'll never respond to this but i just wanted to ask you know so and so forth i always 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 respond to those messages at the moment while i can and even when it gets a bit overbearing i'll find a way for them to get a response right. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned in my introduction your slightly cheeky take on life, and um, I think it's probably fair to say that when you were at BGS, you were you were quite well known for a little bit of cheekiness now and again. You weren't always, you know, the the best behaved people, perhaps. Do you think your <laughs> do you think your personality, which you know I think as you come across today as incredibly warm and you know and and human, do you think your personality is, is a major factor in the success that you're having now? Firstly, let me apologise for anything I may have done. <laughs> and I apologise to any of the teachers who are listening right now. Um, yeah, I think that I, I was a bit cheeky on occasion. Um, I think that was that was my way of just being more comfortable in a situation. Yeah. Um, again, like I've always been slightly irreverent. Would I attribute that to the success that I've had? Yeah, because I'm just myself. I just mm -hmm. try and be myself and, and nothing more, nothing less. I think that if we're true to ourselves, we don't paint a picture of something we're not, then we can just, you know, live the, live a happier life, you know? Great. Well, I think that's a, an inspirational um, message that you've given us today. Um, I'm really sorry to say that I think we're, we're out of, uh, of time and um, it's, it's flown by. Many thanks to... Yes all those people who are uh, sent in questions and those people who have been at home watching i hope you agree with me that we've been um well entertained royally i think you could say <laughs> over the last 45 minutes if you haven't watched any of ages programs anybody who's out there i would really recommend that you go on his website i think until the end of march they're actually free to view and uh, i really enjoyed the, the the scottish ones uh you've given us lots of tales of your life as journalist TV presenter, lifestyle guru. So, oh, we've got an, an anonymous comment here which says, A up duck. That's the first comment. <laughs> Great to listen to you. As inspirational as ever. I don't know who this is from. Someone called Miss anonymous. Light. This is definitely from Miss Light. I, I was, yeah. I was, I was watching an episode of Tales of the Unexpected with my mum recently. Featured a bottle of wine from the 1860s, believed to be the last bottle in the world. The wine expert was deliberating if it should if he should open it for a taste. It could be spoiled, or it should it be left as a piece of history. What would you do? And then P.S. Sorry about the dead flowers. <laughs> that, I don't understand that, but maybe you do. Anyway, a up duck. So would you open an 1860s bottle of wine? It could be spoiled, or would you leave it as a piece of history? 
Oh, all right. I'm going to show you something which is right here. Excuse me whilst I grab it. So I'm deliberating exactly the same thing. I have a bottle of 1964 Dom Perignon Ooh, nice. in, my, um, in my wine fridge that I'm going to very gently put back down here and then <laughs> immediately after this, put it back in the wine fridge. Um, to be honest, with a bottle that old, I mean, not knowing exactly what it is, but with a bottle that old, I keep it as a piece of history. The chances are that something from the 1860s, if it's a fortified wine, that changes things. And I might open it, but if it is a still or sparkling red, white wine, etc., um, uh, yeah, I probably just keep it as a wonderful artifact for the future, which I'm, I'm toying with. I'm going to look at the actual cork fitting on this and see if I think it's been ruined. And if it has, then when anyone comes over, they can just see that I've got a 1964 bottle of Dom Perignon. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Excellent advice. Well, all it remains for me to do really is to thank you once again, Aidy, for taking time out of I know what is your very busy schedule. Uh, it's been fascinating to see where life has led you after BGS. And, and I think we all get the impression that you're happy in yourself. Your career is really booming and you know, you're on the up. So once again, from all of us here at BGS, a massive thanks. Good luck in all that you do in your endeavours in the future. Uh, we wish you all the very best uh, and we uh, we wish you um, the best of luck for the future. Thank you okay. ever so much. And thank you to everyone who watched as well. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of the week weekend and drink something nice. OK, <laughs> thanks very much, Aidy. Take care. Cheerio. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.